the Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and is armed with strength. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. The seas have lifted up, O Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves. Mightier than the thunder of the great waters. Mightier than the breakers of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Once again, I welcome you to Majesty. My name is Ron McKinney and I'm Pastor Kinsey Drive Baptist Church. Uh, our study today is going to be in the epistle to the Corinthians, the second letter that the Apostle Paul wrote. We're going to go to chapter 5. I'll just give you that heads up so that if you want to prepare and get your Bible and be able to read with me. Uh, I just have a few things I would like to comment about. At the time of the taping of this program, I do not know the outcome of our election, but I would say this, that uh, I am not worried about the outcome because I believe that God is in control of all things. He works His will, and uh, I believe that whatever happens is in the will of God. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have a responsibility. We certainly do. But what I'm saying is I'm not worried about what the future is because I know that God is the one who holds the future and he's in control. We don't believe in chance and fate and luck. We believe in a God who works all things well after the counsel of his will. So whatever the outcome, we can accept it as being God's will. Now that doesn't mean we have to always be pleased with it. In fact, uh, I probably not knowing the outcome can tell you there would be things about co both candidates that I wouldn't be pleased about. But I do know this, that it is God that puts kings upon the throne and he's also the one who brings them down from the throne. And it is he that works all things for his own pleasure and for his own glory. So we can accept that. It gives us a reason to have hope as a believer that God is working in all of this. And ultimately, I will tell you this, ultimately in the end, it is God who wins. And all things are going to be brought to the glory and the praise of God in the end, that Jesus might be glorified. So if you'd like to turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm going to give you one of the most important verses of Scripture that I think that we have in all of the Word of God, and that is it has to do with the fact that salvation is in the person of Jesus Christ. Whenever I listen to someone who claims to be a preacher, a preacher of the gospel, or just any kind of preacher, I'm listening for one thing, and I'm listening for the name of Jesus Christ. What does he have to say about the person of Jesus Christ? What does he have to say about what Jesus did when he came into this world? We were looking at one who is the Savior of men, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to begin reading at verse 9 of this chapter, and I'm going to read through probably verse 21. So please be patient with me. As we go through, I will perhaps make a few comments here and there, but there are certain ones that I want to give you a little extended comments about. Verse 9 of chapter 5. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. All of a sudden we see here, there's a revelation that's going to be made. And this revelation is it's going to be appeared that everyone will receive what's done in the body, whether it be good or bad. There is a day of reckoning that is coming. And he says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. This is Paul speaking here. 
and he knows something of the terror of the Lord. He knows that to fall into the hands of God without being in Christ Jesus is something that we ought to be terrorized by because it means that we will spend eternity without God, we'll spend eternity in a place of torment and of misery and of woe. Now, many people don't think of this, but this is what it's all about. In the end, your soul is going to spend eternity in one place or the other. And so Paul says, I know something of the terror of the Lord. And he means also by that, not just simply that there is something ahead, that if you are not in Christ, you will be judged and will be condemned to a devil's hell. But he also means you'll be separated from God. You will not know anything of the love of the God that made you. He says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And so the whole motivation he says here that I have is I know what is coming and I'm, in, I'm persuaded. I'm going out and I'm finding men and what I desire to do is to convince them if I possibly can of what the future is if they're not in Christ. You know, there's a day when we used to fear, fear God and have a sense of the fear of God. I remember uh, early in, in when I was a boy that used to talk about people being God-fearing people. That's how they were, they were considered as being someone that had the fear of the Lord. Now, what did they mean by that? Well, it wasn't just simply that they feared God with a sense of terror and dread, but they feared Him in the sense of respect. They feared Him because when they did things, they did it out of respect for God. Now, everything wasn't perfect for sure, but men used to make uh, deals simply by shaking the hand, and you could trust a man because he was a God-fearing man. But here we see he says something about that all will appear before the judgment seat of God. And he says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory in our behalf, that ye may have something to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your sake. As this Paul speaking here, he's talking about his own ministry and how he approaches it. But he says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth, listen to this, live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Here's the very purpose for which he died, he's telling us. He says, no longer do we live for self. We live in a day when people are living for themselves. Everything is centered around what is best for me. What is going to bring me the most happiness? What am I going to receive out of this? Self is put into the place of where God should be. And so he's telling us here, this will change. Those that are changed by the grace of God, what happens to them? Well, that ugly nature that desires to be self-centered and everything for self is changed. And now it's wanting to give glory and praise to God and to the person of Jesus Christ. I have several examples I could give you right here in Dalton of some men that I know whose lives have been changed. Marvelous change that's taken place. And I, I heard one give a testimony just the other day and he was a very famous football player from Dalton High School and also from the University of Tennessee. And he was an outstanding athlete. And how he lived his life, and he confessed, I lived my life for self, 
for my own pleasure. He told about all the things that he went through and how his life was one that was shipwrecked and the things that took place. And then God in his grace came and showed him, showed him and opened his heart to the truth concerning Jesus Christ. And he became a new creation in Christ Jesus. And that man today goes around and he tells others about the glory of Jesus Christ and of the grace of God. How wonderful it is to know that God is able to change a person. It is something that is done by the working of the Holy Spirit. So he says here, For the love of Christ constrains us, constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them, and rose again. The purpose for living is for the glory of God. And then he goes on to say, Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. This is second uh, Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Remember this verse of Scripture. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now that is an interesting verse because to me it's the gospel in a nutshell. That is, He's saying that everything has to do with a person being in union with Jesus Christ. Now, that's not just simply knowing about him. It's not gathering up all kinds of facts and uh, all kinds of things that we would hear or read about Jesus and what he did and so forth. Rather, it is the fact that we have a relationship. We're, we know him. We have an intimacy with him. If any man be, and the word there is in Christ. Ice is the Greek word. It's a word that Paul uses many times in all of his writings, about 150 times in his writings. He uses that, that little preposition in, in Christ. In him we have everlasting life. He uses it over and over in to be in union with Jesus Christ. So now he's speaking here of the fact if anyone, any man is in Christ, what is it? What happens to him? He becomes a new creation. He's brand new. I want to ask you today, do you know that you have had a time in your life when you came to an understanding and you believed in Jesus Christ and your life was changed. Do you know that? Because what the Bible teaches me that everyone that is in Christ is a new creature. Now, I use the term sometimes creation because the word there has to do with creation. I always reflect on this because the Apostle Paul, when he's writing this, he must have went back to Genesis chapter 1. In verse 1 it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Well, this word creation, that's something special. We didn't have anything to do with creation. That was God speaking everything into existence. And so what he's telling us here, if we are in Jesus Christ, there's something new about us. There's a change that takes place. God takes out the heart of stone and he gives a heart of flesh. I've had people testify when they've seen someone that they knew before and how they were a hard person. They were difficult and they, they had a, a, a personality that just rubbed you the wrong way and they they were just very difficult. And then God comes and he changes them. He gives them a new nature. And all of a sudden, 
There's a love. They care about people. They want to do that which is pleasing in God's sight. That's important for us to see, that everyone that's in Christ is going to have a new nature. It's going to be one that will love Christ supremely. The Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. My friend, you can't serve God and mammon, and that means money. You cannot serve God in something else. It is Christ alone. We must look to Him and serve Him. He is our Master and our Lord. Let me go on and read a little further. Verse 18, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 18 says, And all things are of God. Well, I can't help but stop here because it's saying that all of this that takes place is the work of God. Now he said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Now, if that's something that is all of God, then it's God that does that work. God that calls men out of darkness into light. It's the work and the power of God. Now, we sometimes use terminology like this. We talk about modernism, monergism, meaning that it is all of God. It's all the work of God. He alone does it. There's no cooperation of man. Synergism has to do with cooperation, where it's God and man working together. And most of the people that I know who, who claim to be Christians, many of them, they think that their salvation was something that they cooperated with and they did it also. They had something to do with it. The truth of the matter is from Scripture, it is all of God's working. God is the one who calls us. He's the one who brings conviction. You remember the Thessalonians said, the word of God has come to us, not in word only, but in the power and the demonstration of the Holy Spirit and with great conviction. What, how did that happen? It was because God came to them in power. He brings conviction. Now, I know that the Bible teaches me in Romans chapter 10 that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that is the truth because unless God brings to us of faith and repentance, we will never believe and never repent. It's a gift of God, but it's all of God. That's what Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 2 when he said, we're saved by grace through faith, and that's not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Now, if you've heard that before, which I know you probably have, you must see in that that it is all of God's working from beginning to the end. You remember, Jesus is our, our Savior. He's, he's the beginning and the end. He's the Alpha and the Omega. Everything having to do with our salvation has to do with the person of Jesus Christ. I do not contribute anything to my salvation. It is all of God. Well, you say, well, don't you believe? Yes, you must believe. Unless you believe, you will perish, the Bible teaches me. But we believe because God has granted to us faith. You say, well, I don't have faith. Well, you call upon God. Now, I know that what I've taught you before is that you're dead in trespasses and sins. But at the same time, the Bible says, seek the Lord. Seek him while he may be found. Call upon him while he may be near. In other words, in, in the sense of our human response, from our sense of responsibility, we must call upon him. Now the Lord then comes in his grace. and He will not refuse anyone who calls upon him. He will receive you. But listen, it is God who comes and brings the Holy Spirit to change you. Now listen to what else it says. 
He says in verse 19, To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, listen to this, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed to us the word of reconciliation. And it says here simply this, it says, those that are in Christ, he says, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. In other words, the charge against them has been taken by Jesus Christ himself. He has borne our sin. He has borne our transgressions. They'll never be charged against us again. He died in our place as a substitute. If ever you could learn and understand what it is that Jesus did in terms of taking our place. The Bible says the just died in the place of the unjust. He should have never gone to the cross because he had no sin of his own. He was sinless. And yet he came. And he purposefully took upon himself the form of a servant. He became a man for one purpose. And that purpose was in order that he might take your place. If you believe and trust in Jesus Christ, he died in your stead. It's substitutionary atonement as the Bible speaks of it. It is the fact that he paid the penalty in full. We sing that song, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. It is all the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now he says he gives to us the word of reconciliation. Verse 20, Thou then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For, verse 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Remember I mentioned that word in, that preposition, in him. We have been made the righteousness of God in him. How did that happen? It's the fact that Jesus, who was without sin, he came, he suffered. They mocked him. They took him through a puppet court and they accused him. They spat upon him. They, they mocked him and saying, if you are the, the Christ, then come down from this tree. They mocked him called him. They had a sign that said, King of the Jews, which was the truth. But, oh, they hated him. And so consequently, what we see, here he is as he suffers and he dies, and he's doing this for one purpose, not because of his own sin. Jesus had no sin, and what he did was he took our sin, or the, the burden of our sin, and which he died in our stead, in our place. You must understand that to understand the gospel concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. He died in our stead. In order that he might make us, it says here, the righteousness of God in him. I'll tell you what, I have no righteousness of my own. There's nothing good within Ron McKinney. Do you understand what I'm saying? I have nothing to commend to God. I have no merit. Well, you say, well, Ron, you, you preach the gospel and you do this and you do that. Oh, but those are things that do not have any merit before God. I have nothing to commend before Him. You know what? Anything that is done, it's because of God's grace and His mercy. But what he said is, he says, I am the righteousness of God. Jesus Christ has given to me his perfection. 
I've received his righteousness. I have the robe of the righteousness of Christ. And I stand today accepted in the beloved, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know him? Have you ever come? And I, I say this each week, and I, I hope that you understand what I've been talking about, because sometimes people think that they're saved, they think that they know, but they've never had the quickening work of the Holy Spirit. That is, when God comes and changes, changes the heart. You love him now supremely. In fact, the Bible speaks of it. You treasure him. You want him more than anything else in the world. What do you treasure? Well, men sometimes treasure money and power and position and things and all this sort of thing. You know, they're always having some kind of treasure. It's like the rich young ruler that came to Jesus, said, what good thing can I do that I could be saved? And the Bible tells us that he turned away and went away because he had great possessions. He didn't have a sense of need. Oh, but if you have a need, you come to him and he will hear you and he will answer your prayer. Bow with me in prayer now, will you please? Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I thank you, Father, that you've given us a Savior. And I thank you, Lord, that he came in order that he might purchase us and buy us out of the slave market of sin. He's granted unto us life eternal in believing and trusting in Him. May my hearers come right now by trusting and by faith receiving Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being with us today. I have a publication here from our church I'd be happy to send to you. Kinsey Drive Baptist Church, 2626 Kinsey Drive, Dalton, Georgia, 702. Uh, pardon me, 30720, or you can call 706-277-3505. We'd love to hear from you. Come and worship with us at Kinsey Drive. We have Sunday morning services, Sunday school at 10, and worship at 11, and Bible study at 6, and then Wednesday nights at 6.30, we're studying once again on Knowing God by J.I. Packer. Please come and be with us. Until then, may God richly bless you. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and is armed with strength. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. The seas have lifted up, O Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves. Mightier than the thunder of the great waters. Mightier than the breakers of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty.